everybody. Thank you for joining. Happy Wednesday. Hey, middle of the week. Almost done with the week. I know some of you guys are really excited. Man. It's a beautiful day today. We're midway through April. Isn't that crazy? Time is just flying. So we got a couple things to go through today. Um, hopefully you guys are ready for today. Um. I mentioned the Tower of Babel yesterday and then Pentecost at the same time um, to try to link these things for you guys. I didn't even realize that Shavuot is Monday, Monday till Tuesday morning. Uh, Shavuot is uh, the Hebrew word for what Passover is. Um, so it's actually relevant that we go over these things. Let's see. Um, so let's go ahead and pray, guys, and then we'll get into the material. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this day that you blessed us with, giving us another opportunity to seek after you, O Father. We are privileged, O Lord, to be able to enjoy your word, O Father, and your wisdom that you have here, O God. We are excited to learn from you today, O Lord. May you reveal to us things that we maybe have not been able to see previously, O oh Lord. Show us the treasures, the nuances, the hidden things that you find the light in hiding from us to find, O oh God. We seek you in intimacy and we desire you above everything and all things, O oh God. We praise you and we bless you in this moment, thanking you for our lives and all that we have, all that you are doing and all that is yet to occur. You are God Almighty, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You are Alpha and Omega, King of Glory. You are our God, our Father, and our Beloved. We pray for that wisdom, O Lord. We pray for the removal of distractions. Help us, O Lord, to understand your word. Bless our homes, our marriages, our finances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you guys for joining. God bless you. Um, let me know, guys, if it sounds okay and if everything looks good. I, I'm looking at levels and stuff now. It seems like it's okay. Um, I apologize for any inconveniences that may have occurred before. But um, so we've been going through Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. Um, let me go ahead and pull that up. Actually, I have other things pulled up. Um, let's see here. And we were talking about how Paul desires to go to Spain. Um, and the, the way that I could tell you guys in short form and keep it succinct is that Paul wanted to get to Spain for the sake of for the sake of uh, basically reaching the end of the world as they know it. But it actually gets a little bit deeper than that. And the reason why I didn't mention this before is because in order to explain this, we have to get really, really deep into the story and narrative of the Bible in ways probably you haven't before. And I'm trying to figure out how we even do this. Um, so basically what happens at Pentecost, we know that there's the apostles. They don't really know what's going on at this point. Jesus has ascended into heaven. They are left alone. And what they are waiting for is for the father and the son to send the spirit as they had promised before. And they are just there, just waiting. Um, Peter finally rises up and convicts the Jews for what they have done. So we could actually start in Acts chapter 2. You guys may be familiar with this. If you, if there are any Pentecostals, um, you would be familiar with this. This is like the Magna Carta for Pentecostals. But I'm not sure if this has ever been brought to your attention. But 
let's go ahead and read a little bit. Um, we'll read 1 through 13. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. So several things I want you to take note of as I continue forward. Um, verse 2 is should draw at least a little bit of a connection to John chapter 3. About the spirit coming and going. And we know not where it comes from nor where it goes. So this is something that we can draw some type of allusion to so that we can understand that. The ways of God are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And if you put this in the context of Jews at the moment, it really doesn't make sense once we start. I mean, it does and it does not. And I'll explain why. Um, for Jews, they're going to be jealous in a sense because of who's here in attendance, the Gentiles. Um, another thing to keep in consideration as we mo are moving it says they began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance they understood each other that's something important to understand and then devout men from every nation under heaven now whether the bible actually means that it doesn't mean what it says directly there because obviously every nation under heaven wasn't there but to their mind it was and then we go to verse six. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. That word bewildered is very important to the connection that we're going to make in the book of Genesis. Because each one of, uh, sorry, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So again, something to take note of here the speaking in tongues that's happening here is not what we with all the respect like i'm not saying this to cause strife or anything what we are, are seeing here is not the tongues that we see in church this is not the you know it, it's saying that they heard each other in their own language meaning that if you're somebody who speaks cantonese and i was talking to you right now you would be hearing this in cantonese that's what's happening in the in the book of Acts chapter two by first Corinthians chapter um, 14, 12 and 14. There's some type of development with the sp spiritual language that it seems to be different than what's going on in Acts chapter two. That's just something to keep in mind. Um, but anyways, uh, verse seven shows are not all these who are speaking Galileans, right? These are Jews from Galilee that they are talking about. And how is it that we hear each one? Sorry, each of us in his own native language. This is important, right? Like imagine, imagine being in New York City. You got a, a man from India. You got a man from China, a man from south africa or nigeria you got a man from native australia uh canadian speaking french and everybody's in the same room and we're all talking the same language that that would be strange right and and each man not just that we're all talking the same language but each man is hearing the language in their own tongue i don't know about you but if i heard a an Australian talking to me in Spanish, that would be kind of a little bit odd. I wouldn't say ch uh, Chinese because there are a lot of Chinese in Mexico and Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. I know many Chinese, especially in New York, Chinese people talk Spanish. So that's there's nothing strange about that to me. 
So we keep that in mind, right? Now, what's very important for us next is verses 9 through 10. Through 11, I apologize. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So what's a proselyte? A proselyte is a convert, a non-Jew convert to Judaism. That's what a proselyte is. Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Keep that in mind. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. Okay. So, several things that we have to keep in mind here. When we're studying the Word of God and you come across things like this, don't just brush it over. If you want to deepen your study with the Word of God, with the Lord, because remember, guys, the Bible is God himself. I always tell you guys, look at your relationship with the Bible as an intimate relationship with the one that you love. I always talking about I'm always talking about if you love somebody, you're going to pay attention to the details. Right. Why? Because they have your attention. They have your desire in a way that nobody else will. So. When you're reading the word of God, try to see these words. I know it's just words on a page and you're like, how can I, you know, how can I desire this in that way? In the same way that I'm trying to tell you, I'm highlighting specific things to you that are jumping off at the page to me that are bringing me to other places. They're pointing me in other directions about the character of God. So again, let's go through this one more time. I'm not going to read it again. I'm going to just point out details so that you can see. So what's happening? Pentecost has arrived. Uh, Pentecost comes from the Greek, which just means the 50th day. Again, that's the Greek word for the Hebrew word Shavuot, which is Passover. Again, the 50th day. Um, they were all together in one place. Verse two is important in regard to John chapter three, because again, John chapter three is not about baptism. John chapter three is about the kingdom of God is nothing what you would think it would look like. And he was talking to the teacher of not just the teacher, like, or a teacher, like one of the top teachers in Judaism, one of the top rabbis, Nicodemus, he's saying, you think, you know, but you have no clue what it's going to look like. And then Pentecost is evidence of what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus because all these nations are in the same place. And what's funny is that initially they don't know what's going on. So I'm not sure if you guys know this, by the way, the author of the book of Acts is um, Luke. And the book of Acts was never separated from the book of Luke. Luke and Acts was one single, single volume of work. It was never separated. We separate it now because it seems appropriate, but that's not how it was in the, in the early church. So another thing to keep in mind, and the way that I draw to John chapter 3 is the mighty rushing wind, the Holy Spirit. Three is divided tongues. Where does that show up in the Bible? Uh, that, that shows up in Genesis chapter 11. And then the filling of the Holy Spirit happens. They're all speaking the same language. And then men from every nation. But at the time that they understood it, not as we understand it today. The word bewildered catches my attention. They are amazed and astonished because everybody's speaking their own native language and everyone's understanding in their own native language. Then 9 through 11 is particularly important, and I'm going to show you why. In order to understand why this is important, we have to look at a map. Let's see. Is this the one that I wanted to show? Yes. Look at this. 
all the nations that are mentioned in Acts chapter 2. Let me see if I can enlarge this. Perfect. Let's go here. These are the nations in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost because Pentecost happens in Jerusalem. When I tell you, don't just skip over things because it's whatever, like, oh, here we go again, listing, you know, 17 generations. I'm tired of like looking at the same thing. The, the Bible is not doing this for no reason. God is not arbitrary. And when you're just like, oh, here we go again with the, the, the nonsense, you're really saying that to God. You know what I mean? So if you skip over these things, it's natural human tendency. I understand. But I just want to put it into your perspective of imagine if somebody, when you're talking, they're like, oh, my God, here we go again with this story. You got to really make this personal to yourself so you don't skip over these things and lose things that are really important to God. Because look at what's happening here. These are all the the nations that are being um, that, that were articulated in Acts chapter two. We have Elam, Media, Parthia, Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Pamphylia, uh, Phrygia, Asia, Rome, Crete, Cyrene, Egypt, Judea, and Arabia. Again, why is this important? Because these are the nations as they know it are coming together in a singular place. Now, why would this be important? Let's go back to this so you can see that this is what we are saying. We'll repeat this one time. Parthians means Elamites that are residents of Mesopotamia. So you'll know those three are in a group called Mesopotamia. Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. That's another group. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya. Um, they belong to Cyrene. That's another group. And visitors from Rome. That's another group. And they were both Jews and proselytes, meaning Jews and converts to Judaism. And then the Cretans and the Arabians. So let's look at that map one more time. So you can see what's happening here. This is not it. This is it. Again, look at them being represented. So if you're in Jerusalem at the time, you're this is what the Bible is saying that all the nations under heaven, because remember, this is all they know at the time. Now you're going to you're going to see that the and, and what's the point of Pentecost is to talk about the gospel. Right. Um, and what happened? It's a recollection. That's why Peter goes over the condom, the judgment against the Jews to cut them at their heart. Do you find it interesting of anybody that's missing at this point? That's not represented. That is mentioned in other parts of the Bible. Ethiopia, which is south of Egypt. And then who else? Spain, Tarshish or Tarshish. Why is that important? Because Philip in the book of Acts, chapter eight, six chapters from this is going to find himself with who the Ethiopian eunuch. So here what's happening is this is the demonstration of God wanting the gospel to reach all the areas of the earth. So Philip reaches Ethiopia, which is not represented here. And this is why Paul's desire is to get to Spain is because Spain wasn't represented at Pentecost. Right. So his desire is to go throughout all this area going north from Jerusalem, west all the way and then. Rome is, you can see it as the last one on the top left. And then past that is, um, is uh, Tarshish. You can see it here, represented better here. The Torah.com, this is a great website, by the way. They're not Christian, they're Jews. If you are a Christian that desires to know more about the Jewish Bible or the Jewish traditions, this is an excellent resource. However, you just have to remember that they don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah and you got to take it with, um, with a grain of salt. So what is this here? What is Elam? What is Canaan? What is Sheba? What is Seba? What is Tarshish? What is Ashkenaz? This is the world of Genesis chapter 10. Can I make this bigger? No. So this is the world after the flood. This is Genesis chapter 10 again. So we're in the land of Canaan. So to the east is what? Elam. 
To the west is Spain, Tarshish. To the south is East Africa, Seba and Sheba, Yemen. Um, and then to the north is Ukraine, the Ashkenaz. Uh, you may have heard of Ashkenazi Jews before. That's, that's a thing. Um, so this is the world according to Genesis chapter 10. Why is this important? Are, is anybody starting to see the the connection that's being made between Pentecost and after the flood? So just to put it plainly, to make sure that we're con so that you could connect the dots as we continue to teach. The point of the story of Babel, right? The story of Babel is that men congregated. They had one nation right one language they were unified and they desired to do what build the tower build a mountain themselves we need to read genesis chapter 11 we'll get there in a second but i just want to show you what is this here because these are the three sons of noah shem ham and japheth if i'm not mistaken japheth is all the way all that greece um italy and tarshish area excuse me he's all the way to the left that's what's important for us um 70 nations are represented you can't if you read this in genesis chapter 10 it'll make no sense so let's go back to genesis chapter 10 where are we genesis 9 genesis 10 so to make the connection here you have to look at this this is why you you can't skip these things as boring as they may be at, at least if you're going to skip through it, skim through it and see what sounds familiar. So we start with Noah. Obviously, he's the father. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's three sons. The sons of Japheth are Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshesh, and Tiras. I'm not going to go over all of this, but we're going to... I'm going to call out things that catch my atten attention. Sorry. Gomer, Ashkenaz. Tarshish, Spain, Ketim, Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, Canaan, right? Ham, the, the, the Ham is where the land of Canaan, that's the promised land. Cush, we know Cush, Nimrod, he's going to be important in 11, the Genesis 11. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord is what that means. Um, Babel, Akkad, meaning the Akkadians, Assyria, Nineveh. Let's see what else. So this is the way that you will go through this. Like you will start to decode. Sidon sounds familiar. Amorites, Jebusites, Girgashites. These are important in the book of Joshua. The Hivites, right? The All the Ites. <laughs> the Canaanites, obviously. Sodom, Gomorrah. So this is just showing you, and if you were to look at this from the perspective of the nations of, um, let's go here. This is, I'm a visual person. So when I go through things like this, I try to look at a map so I can understand it. So Japheth is actually all of East Asia, Turkey, and then Europe from what it's showing here. Shem is like the Iraqi area that that like light yellowish color um that's actually where abraham is from where it says i'm not sure if you guys can see that but the uh the persian gulf all the way to the right that little peninsula not the peninsula i'm sorry right where it opens the four rivers are pouring into that's actually ur where abraham is from He's Ur of the Chaldeans. So he's from modern day Iraq. So if you can imagine, Abraham does this journey all the way from Ur, Iraq, all the way to Israel, to Canaan or the land of Ham, all the way to the left. He does this, this bow type of movement. I know that's kind of small imagery. So let's try to pick this in a different way excuse me okay maybe this is a little bit better so i know 
these people now have different names, but what's interesting about the overlap between Genesis chapter 10 and Pentecost, Acts chapter 2? Again, let's look at the uh, look at this. What is being represented here at Pentecost? Is it not the same thing that's being shown here in the nations here? The Amorites, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Miz the Mizraimites, the P the Potites, the Elamites, you know, the Ashkenazi, the Gomorites, all of these ites, the Hittites, and all these people. What's important? They overlap. Why? Okay. So to make this clear so that we can understand, and this is just a different way you, you can see it there on the right. Um, let's see. I don't know what this is. I've never seen this, but it looks like they're going to connect. Are they connecting the same thing? Let's check. I wonder if they're making the connection between um, Babel and. No, this is Abraham. Where's the rest of. Oh, yeah, they are at the bottom. They're making the connection. Acts chapter two. Uh -huh. Okay. Cool. I like this little uh, hand-drawn art style. That's beautiful. Okay, um, so look at the overlap again one more time, and then we're going to go to Genesis chapter 10 because I want to read this to you. Sorry, not 10, 11, so we can understand what's happening. So just again, I don't even think I finished what I said to keep in mind. What's happening at Babel is that men are trying to go to heaven. Men are trying to build up in their pride to make a name for themselves to build up. They're building a mountain. In Jewish tradition, it's often thought that the, the Garden of Eden was on top of what? A mountain. In the Let's see if we could actually pull up iconography about this so that you can see what I'm talking about. Let's see. So it's often in Jewish tradition, it's declared that Eden was a top of mountain because the word Eden means like a hedged in garden. And the book of Genesis describes it as, yeah, you see how there's mountainous range here. And that's the gate that opens, kicking them out. This is a mountain. So in Jewish tradition, it is thought to be that Eden was a top of mountain because, again, in Hebrew, the, the indication is that um, in the book of Genesis, I apologize, that the four rivers are flowing. And w we know that rivers don't flow upwards. Rivers flow downwards. So the four rivers that are coming out of uh, Eden, it gives us more indication that this is a mountain. And we know this even further because. Uh, the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible speaks about this in more depth and the prophets specifically Ezekiel. It talks about the Garden of Eden being like that of a mountain. And the reason why mountains were important in the ancient times is that it was common knowledge. And I want to say common knowledge. I don't want to try to act like these things are unreal. It was common knowledge that the deity lived at the top of the mountain. So this is why you see that God, what does he do? God visits or meets the people of Israel where? At Mount Sinai. Why? Because he's he's encouraging the narrative that God is above us. Like, you know, he's unapproachable. That's why the cloud sits on the, th the, the, the mountain so that it can protect the people from the rawness of God's presence. So why is that important? Because what's happening in Genesis chapter 10 is that men are trying to build a mountain for themselves. They want to return to Eden. They're, they're, this is their plan. They're, they're trying to build up to go back to, to be in, in, in the place of the gods, right? Keep that in mind. Now, the reason why it's important of what God's doing in Acts chapter 2 is because God is now reversing what the what men and the devil wanted to do, right? So men are trying to go up, but what happens at Pentecost is that God is coming down. So keep that in mind. Pentecost, the purpose of Pentecost is 
is not necessarily baptism or speaking in tongues or anything like that. The purpose is that Genesis chapter 10 is that men try to ascend themselves into heaven. But Acts chapter 2 is that God descended, right? So keep that in mind as we read Genesis chapter 10. Uh, sorry, I keep saying 10, 11. It's only a few verses. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Why is it starting like that? Do you think it's, do you, do you not find it interesting that Acts chapter two starts almost the same way? And as people migrated from the east, they found the plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build for ourselves. Pay attention to the language. This is very prideful. They said to one another, let us make bricks. So they're not even saying, let's go, let's grab trees. Let's use the, let's use the natural resources to create, right? They want to manipulate and create for themselves. Think about industrialism. This is what's happening here in this moment. They want to take from the world and create of their own, even the very resources that they are using. And then they are saying, what? Come, let us build this ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they, that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Don't you find it interesting that God says that? Has that ever struck you as strange that God says they, no matter what they put their mind to, they're, ba they're basically going to do that, right? think about nasa yeah i was actually going to mention that when i was talking about them building a mountain if you think about the billion the billionaires race to get to 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 space it's the same thing that we're doing now nasa and all these international space programs um that's all they're doing it's babylon all over again it's babel they they want to ascend into the heavens so yeah good observation and the Lord came. Oh, sorry. So they propose to do will now be impossible for them. They, they can do whatever they want, basically. Why? Because they are created in the image of God. It, it doesn't mean literally they could do anything. But this is important because you have to remember that Genesis 11 is like the yin and yang of Acts and two. Uh, sorry, Acts two. Yin and yang, Genesis 11, Acts chapter 2, they, they contrast one another. The same way that, Gen I don't know if you guys ever knew this, but Genesis chapters 1 through 3 is the yin to Genesis 4 to 6, which is the yang. So Genesis 1 through 3 is the creation of God of the world. Genesis 4 to 6 is the reversal of men for God's creation. I don't know if you guys ever noticed that. So there's this repetition that's, that seems to keep happening in the book of Genesis. One through three is God creating creation, planting the man in the Garden of Eden. They fall at the cusp of three. But then four to six, all of a sudden, we're just going backwards now. We're trying to undo everything that God is doing. I, I want you to keep that in mind because Genesis 11 is the yin to the yang of Je Acts chapter 2. And we're just talking about opposites. They're the contrast. So Acts chapter 2 is God undoing what we did at Genesis chapter 11. Now, why is that important in re regard to verse 6? It's because and nothing they will propose to do will be impossible for them. Now, don't you find it interesting that men alone, God didn't see it prudent to allow them to do whatever they want. But at Pentecost... The same thing, the same sentiment is now true under the the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Now, nothing will be impossible for men for us bringing the gospel everywhere it needs to go. Are you guys following me this or am I being too scatterbrained? I'm just trying to pull everything. I don't have notes when I do this, guys. I, I really do this off the cusp. 
Somebody let me know. I just want to make sure. Let me know, guys. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Now, verse 7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not be able to understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from from there over the face of all the earth and they left off the building off building the city therefore its name was called babel because there there the lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the lord dispersed them over all the face of the earth okay so at babel they were united and they wanted to in their union, right? They they went they came from around the world, right? Let's let's make this visual. They came from around the world, the same as Pentecost, and they met in the land of Shinar. And in their union, what happens? We're here, we're individual pieces, but when we come together, we're stronger. But look at what happens when we come together, right? Like we can build upwards now. This is what God didn't want them to do. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be prideful. So what does God do? He reverses their work and splits them apart by this, by causing division within them. And then what do they do again? They scatter back to where they came from. But in them scattering to where they came from, what is God doing? What is the purpose of that? We have to go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 to understand what is the context of Genesis chapter 11. Before we go there, this word here, uh, let me pull this up. Sorry. This word here confused their language. Come, let us go down and confuse their language. Verse 9. Uh, because there the Lord confused their language. Remember that I told you pay attention to the word bewildered in the Greek well, I didn't tell you it was in the Greek, but in Acts chapter two, it says that when they started talking to each other, they were bewildered. Now, what's so interesting about that word bewildered in the Greek, obviously the Hebrew Bible is written in Hebrew. However, there was something that was common in Jesus time that was called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And the same word that is used for bewildered in Acts chapter two is the same word that is used and confused here in verses seven and nine. It's very intentional language that's happening here because what the Bible is telling you is these are these are ways that you need to start paying attention. This is the Bible system of backlinks. If you understand the way that Wikipedia works is if you have an article, right? You can imagine that this is an article. If you click a word, it puts you to another article that's relevant to that single word. This is what the Bible does. The Bible is Wikipedia, right? So you have to pay attention to those things. And, and you wouldn't know it initially, but on the first inclination, like when if you're already like follow your brain, guys, follow your mind, follow the desires of your heart when you're reading the scripture. If something is like leading you down the breadcrumbs, follow the trail. You know, see where it takes you and then start getting into the deeper and deeper details. And then that's where these little things will start popping out at you, basically. Okay, so basically, all the nations come, meet at Shinar. They want to build up. God destroys their, well, destroys their unity, brings them out. In Pentecost, he does, he calls all the nations together at Jerusalem. And what does he do? He doesn't let them build up. God comes down again through the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit as Jesus proclaimed in the book of John. You guys are following me? And then what is happening here? They're now under the Spirit of the, of the Lord. Now they have the unity that they desired before. But they find unity and humility by what? Through subjugation of the Holy, subjugation to the Lord through the Holy Spirit. That's what we're seeing. So what is important about Genesis chapter 11? 
we have to go to Deuteronomy 32 to understand what is the purpose of this. Because if you don't understand Genesis 11, you won't understand why God chooses Israel. Have you ever thought why Israel? You think just because whatever, like God was like, oh, well, I really like this guy. He, he explains several times in the Hebrew Bible that the reason why God chose Israel, especially in the book of Ezekiel, that he chose her. And I know it sounds weird to say her, but that's God's bride and his daughter. And he chose her. The reason why he did was because she was nothing. She was nothing. The Bible says that Abraham was a Hittite or, you know, his mother was a Hittite. He's like really downplaying. It sounds very disrespectful when you read it in the, in the book of Ezekiel. We've read it before on lives. And God is basically saying, I chose you because you were nothing. Just like in, in Paul, when he says that the, the, the gospel is foolishness to the Greek and a stumbling block to the Jew. Why? Because God uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. He chose Israel because she was nothing among the nations. She was the least of all. Just like in the book of Judges, uh, Judges chapter 6, Gideon tells the angel of the Lord, Why have you chose me? I'm the weakest of my clan in the, in, the, in the tribe of Benjamin. God always chooses the weakest so that they can't boast. They cannot. But anyways, um, let me see. Where is this? Okay. Verse 8 is going to be the important part. Let me just make sure where I'm going to read up to. Okay, we got to read from 1 to 9. Bear with me. I'm going to read it first, and then I'm going to explain to you what's happening here. Excuse me. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. So who is God talking to heaven and earth? But not just heaven and earth. He's talking to his angels and to the people of the earth. May my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. In, others, in other words, let it come upon you like peace. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. This is Moses speaking, by the way. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. Who's the rock? Jesus Christ. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will teach you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. This is one of the most fascinating verses in the Bible. And as I read it, you know, there was a time that I would read the Bible and I'll be like, bro, none of this stuff makes sense, man. None of this stuff has any significance like it doesn't draw me. I don't know what's happening. But when you start paying attention to the details, oh, my God, you will fall in love all over again. What is God saying here through Moses? Verse eight and nine is very, very interesting. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, what, what, what is he talking about there? He gave to the nations their inheritance. What nations? Genesis chapter 10. When he divided mankind, when did God divide mankind? Genesis chapter 11. He fixed the borders of the peoples 
according to the numbers of the sons of God. What what is God talking about there? This language, this sons of God, Ben Elohim in the Hebrew, is found in Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God are the angels of the Lord. So what is this saying here? God divided the people at the Tower of Babel. And what did he do? He disinherited the nations. Meaning, he said, these people are not my people anymore. I'm giving them up to the powers that be. Think about the book of Colossians. Think about the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Why is it that Paul talks about principalities, thrones, dominions, all of that stuff? It's not just a cute prayer for us to be like, yeah, I got the arbor of God on. No, Ephesians chapter 6 is talking about Deuteronomy chapter 32 and Genesis chapter 10 and 11. And then Acts chapter 2. That's the reference that's being made there. And then Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 10. Um, God divided the people and he gave them up. He said, here, now you take them. You take them. That's where all the gods came from. Because God divided the people to the gods. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. He gave up everybody to all the other principalities of the world but he said israel shall be mine why is that important guys because the plan for god was he gave up all the nations but the point of pentecost is what that he's taking back the nations that's why jesus died on the cross he came to take back what was his he gave it up in Genesis chapter 11, but he's taking it back in Acts chapter 2. Are you guys following the connection that's being made here? Now, have you guys ever found it weird that Jesus is born from a woman alone and not? Why is it that he doesn't have an earthly father, but he has an earthly mother? Is that not strange to anybody? What is the point of that? This is where it gets really very, very interesting. And I'm sure you've never heard this. Like when I, when I started making these connections like this and I felt like God, I know it sounds weird. Like, yeah, God revealed that to you. But thinking about Acts chapter two being the reversal of Genesis chapter 11 and what happened there. That in Genesis chapter, sorry, ex, Deuteronomy chapter 32, he disinherited the nations. In Acts chapter 2, he's taking them back. The only way that he could take them back is by dying on the cross, right? But remember that I said that Genesis 1 and 3 is one narrative. And then 4 to 6 is the reversal of that narrative. In the same way that Acts 2 is the reversal of Genesis 11. Well... Have you guys ever read Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4, where it talks about the women of men sleeping with the sons of God and then they made giants? Have you ever found that interesting? What is interesting about that is Genesis chapter 6, God is basically, remember that the gospel is about God becoming king. This is weird language that we, we, we say and in, rubs us the wrong way but it's the truth that's what the evangelion is the evangelion or the 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 euangelion is um god becoming king it's the proclamation to not only the nations but to the the spiritual realm as well hear O heavens and hear O earth what the lord has to say that's what the gospel is he's proclaiming what is the work that he accomplished so pay attention to, I wish that I had, where's my iPad? Oh, it's over there. I need to start keeping a pen because this would be very helpful if I had a pen. Um, how can I do this? I want to, I'm a very visual person. Anyways, let's try to do this. If in Genesis chapter six, the recipe to get a giant is a female human woman, and a spiritual, not that angels don't, angels don't have gender in the same sense that we think, but you can call them men, right? Um, you need a spiritual father, 
a spiritual father and an earthly woman, and that creates a giant. Does that sound familiar from anywhere in the in the Gospels? A spiritual father, an earthly thing, creating something that is not known anywhere else in creation? What a spiritual father and an earthly woman creates when they violated the order of creation, what they created was a disaster called giants, the Nephilim. Now, people are always like, well, why did God murder and create genocide and all of this stuff? It's not God killing people for the sake of killing people. The angels, as punishment for them rebelling against God, all that Jacob is doing, all that David is doing in these conquests is killing off the offspring of the rebellious angels. These aren't just normal humans. These are the Akkadians, the Assyrians. They, these are giants. These are hybrid creatures. And God wanted to destroy them. So this is where it gets really deep. And I don't want to get too technical, but demons are not angels. Demons are the disembodied spirits of giants. Because again, if they are half and half, where does the spiritual go when the physical died? Because they can't go to heaven and they can't stay on earth. So what demons are is, this is why Jesus said that when you, when you rebuke a demon and you clean the house, they go to waterless places. The point of him saying waterless places is they're in the in-between. What is a waterless place? It's a desert. It's the in-between of a prosperous land and a prosperous land. There's nothing in between. So where are they? Waterless places. They can't be neither here nor there. So Satan is not a demon, guys. Satan is an angel that has fallen, right? He's a son of God that has fallen. He's not a demon. And I don't want to get too technical, but that's just where this comes from. So if angels slept with or procreated with human women and they created giants and then God eradicated them through the, 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 the conquest of Moses and Joshua and then eventually David cleaning everything up, what is the purpose of Jesus being born of a virgin? This is the ultimate slap in the face to the angels that did what? They rebelled against God. Now, people often ask me, what about the book of Enoch? Should I read it or not? I think that you should, just understanding that it's informative. It's not scriptural. The book of Enoch describes that these 200 angels, Azazel being the leader of these angels, they came into agreement with themselves. They said, let's make a pact and a covenant on top of Mount Hermon. I don't know if you've ever heard of that mountain before. Or... Uh, yeah, on Mount Hermon, right? We're going to make a pact. We're all going to agree to rebel against God so that when the judgment comes, we are not alone. So these two angels go on top of a mountain. Isn't that interesting, right? We're going to descend from heaven and down the mountain to take daughters of men. And we're going to procreate with them. In doing that, God judges them in the book of Enoch and he proclaims them. That these angels that rebelled against God are the angels that are found in the book of Revelation that are put under what? The rivers that were found in the Garden of Eden. Once these pieces start to connect, it's crazy. So getting back to the point of Jesus being born of a virgin, Virgin Mary, it's the ultimate slap in the face to the angels. It's the ultimate slap in the face. I don't know if you guys ever remember me saying that in the Garden of Eden, it's my belief and according to Jewish tradition, the Midrash, that Adam was eventually going to get the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. God was eventually going to give it to him, but he wasn't patient enough. Excuse me. I'm not saying that God was eventually going to give men, the angels, you know, daughters of men or anything like that. But it's like God is giving like the ultimate disrespect to the angels because he's like, this is what you try to do. You violated my order of creation and your own body, your own spirit, because they don't have physical bodies. And you violated the physical body of my daughters, although they willingly gave themselves up. And then this is the whole teaching that we did on Romans chapter one. Verses 17 to the end of Romans 1. I don't know if you guys remember that. 
Um, so they did that. And then God is like, look at what I'm going to do. The spirit of the Lord is going to descend on the temple of the Virgin Mary, pure betrothed to Joseph, right? And he produces his own self. Like, isn't that interesting? It's the reversal of Genesis chapter six. So that's, that's fascinating. And the one who comes in the book of Revelation to finally destroy those angels locked away is who? The very, look, it's like God is judging them according to what they very, what was the very sin that they did. So God went around, you know, all this like loopholes. I, I wouldn't say loopholes, but he did it in the most perfect way that he could. Like, isn't that fascinating? So anyways, that's, that's the reversal of, <laughs> that's the reversal of Genesis chapter six is the, the birth narrative of Christ. This is why it's important. Don't skip on the genealogies, guys. Don't, don't do that. Don't skip on the mundane details because God, God is curious if he, if he takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, then the foolish skip. I don't mean no disrespect because I was the fool, the fool of the foolish. I was the most foolish of all the fools. I was the king of fools. I think that God takes the mundane details to hide the deepest secrets of his own word. We skip over these things because we find them unimportant, but hidden in the in the deepest of these things is is the is the greatest and grandest of treasures man it's absolutely incredible incredibles anybody have any questions did anybody find that interesting at all i know that was a lot but hopefully you can understand why why did paul want to get to tarshish because it's the reversal of the Tower of Babel. In Paul's mind, remember, he has, Paul was still a man of his time. God didn't, God didn't make Paul, he didn't download him all the secrets of heaven. He didn't have the Google Giga computers in his heart and mind like he had infinite knowledge. He didn't know. So in his mind, the only person that was not represented in the table of nations at Pentecost was who? Ethiopia and Spain. But Philip already got to Ethiopia through Candace. So to Paul, he's like, bro, all I got to do to complete my mission is get to Spain. Once I get to Spain, I, I fulfilled the gospel of Christ and Christ can return. Now, here's something else that I'm going to blow your mind with. Paul thought that jesus was going to return in his lifetime what a surprise that was for paul that he died in rome and never got to spain he never completed his mission and jesus never returned imagine the literal transitioning that's a paradigm shift that's an identity breaker if if you ever had one and if you guys don't believe me just read uh first thessalonians second thessalonians paul really thought that paul um uh Paul really thought that Jesus was coming back in his time. But there's a shift in the in the epistles of Paul where eventually he starts to come to terms with these things. So it's very fascinating. Did you say that fallen angels are not demons? Yes, that's exactly what I said. And angels are not angels. As you think, all these things come from the Catholic Church and like the medieval times this is not this is not the way that the early church nor jews before the christian church thought about angels and demons so angel is a job description is not a, a ontological term ontology is 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 like the classification of something so uh ontologically what i am is what a human right ontologically i'm human but my job description is preacher right so the problem with us calling angels angels is we call angels preachers as if that's their ontology angels are not preachers angels are what's called elohim elohim or or that's like another classification actually um ben elohim is the actual thing sons of god 
Where did demons come from? So again, demons are the hybridized creatures of fallen angels as we know it and um, women, daughters of women. So what actually happened, if you read Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4, uh, we could actually go there so you could see. There's not much to glean from this because of uh, how I, I the Bible is very cryptic when it comes to angels and demons. And it's very clear why God does this. All, over and over, especially in the book of Isaiah, God says that he will share his glory with no one. So he's not going to give credit to people so that they could feel like they're cool. He's not going to do that. Not in his own scriptures. He, he gives very limited information. So the way that you would get this information is from the book of Enoch. This is why the book of Enoch is important. You would say, well, why would I read the book of Enoch? It's not scripture. Well, Peter and Paul thought it was prudent to read. I mean, even, um, um, why am I forgetting? Bro, why am I forgetting his name right now? <sighs> Sometimes my brain just don't work. It ain't cooperative. Jude, 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 listen, Jude takes an entire verse or two from the book of Enoch, word for word, and doesn't even change it. So if the authors of um, the Bible thought it important to at least inform their worldview, I think it's important for us to inform our biblical worldview as well with the book of Enoch, at least first Enoch. Because there's three parts to it. The book of Enoch is not scripture. It's not canon. Meaning it's not part of the collection of the uh, spiritually inspired books of the Bible. So where demons come from is fallen angels called the watchers in the book of Daniel. That watchers are a... This gets really confusing when you don't understand what re angels really are and you just understand them as angels. So, I don't know how to explain this. How else would you explain this in English? Because in, in Hebrew, it makes more sense because it's not all the same convoluted language. Um, how can I explain this? Let's just call angels sons of God, right? But understand that angel simply means messenger. So this is why it's important to understand that angels don't mean what you think it does. Because if you say that angels are angels, then Jesus is an angel and Jesus is a created being, according to the book of Hebrews. But the book of Hebrews chapter one says that Jesus is is not an angel, because what does the book of Hebrews says to which of the angels did I call my son? Right. So don't commit the error of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So let's think of. Let's think of what we know as angels, as the spiritual sons of God, put them in that classification. And the reason why I say that is because in that spiritual classification of sons of God are seraphim, which are dragons, literally dragons. The word seraph comes from the Hebrew, which means fiery serpent. And then if you read Isaiah chapter six, you see that they have wings, fiery serpents. I don't know if there's any better description than a than a dragon. Leviathan is a dragon as well, according to the book of Job. There are dragons in the Bible and not all of them are are uh, Satan. Um, so there's seraphim, there's cherubim, which Satan was a cherub, according to the book of Ezekiel. Um, there are what we know as angels. The word angel comes from the Greek word angelos. Angelos simply means messenger. So there'll be times that Jesus is referred to as the angelos of God. But that doesn't mean he's an angel. It just means he's a messenger. A message just means I'm bringing a message. That's all that it is. So. In that classification, there's also what's called watchers in the book of Daniel and the watchers. What they were tasked with was literally watching over humanity. That was their task. So the seraphim are like guardian angels for the presence of God, according to the book of Isaiah. Cherubs are protectors of sacred spaces like the book of Genesis. God set a cherub with a flaming sword to protect the gate of Eden, right? So the watchers, according to the book of Daniel, they had to watch over humanity. The sin that the watchers committed is they fell in love with the daughters of men. 
And when they fell in love with them, they created a pact to say, we're going to rebel against God together and we'll take the consequences together. And what they did, they procreated with the women. I don't know how that works, spiritual and physical union. I don't know. Why does it not happen today? I don't know. Maybe they learned from the rebellion. I don't know. Um, and in that that quasi spiritual physical union of as what we know, watcher or angel watcher and daughters of men, when they came together, they got pregnant. What happened? What did they birth? Angels. Now, you know that this story is true because it should be ringing bells and all types of spidey senses in you right now. What is the entire narrative of Greek and Roman mythology? What is the narrative of Norse mythology? Does this not sound repetitive to anybody? Does this not sound absolutely like familiar? You know what I mean? <laughs> That's all Greek, Roman, Norse mythology, uh, Asiatic mythology. This mythology is found in every part of the world. So what do we say that these people were crazy or there's there's so many dots connecting here? I know this is a long winded answer, but I'm trying to teach like in depth. Um, wait, he married now. Didn't know. Congrats. I mean, in, in the spirit, I'm married. I'm waiting on my wifey. That's all that is. Thank you, sir. You are teaching today. I know I'm going to have to run this video back. Praise uh, the Lord Almighty God for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so what happens with these giants, right? Remember, they're hybrid creatures. They're not fully human and they're not fully man. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> so when they die, what the Bible talks about, or at least in the book of giants, which is like another uh, apocryphal text, the book of giants, um, it talks about what was happening in this time during the Genesis 6. The giants, what they basically started to do was accept worship. These demons, the fathers, the watchers started to accept worship. They're, they're what's called the Titans in, in Greek and Roman mythology. Because remember, the Titans preceded the gods of Olympus. Uh, so the Titans are the watchers. Then the gods come as the offspring of the Titans. And in these days, according to the book of giants, what they used to do is they used to dominate all of the human beings. They took all of our resources. They abused us because it's too easy for you to read the scriptures and just think that these things happen from one day to the next. God is patient. God is not God is not affected by time the way that we are. And he lets things play out play out. The Bible says in Peter, he's not slow to complete his promises, wishing that all will come to repentance. So there was a time where the giants dominated all over us, at least from the time of the before the flood, all the way from Genesis chapter six until David finally is like cleaning up the giants. Right. So that's a long span of time to have giants on the earth. So what they used to do was they used to kill humans. They used to eat them. They used to drink their blood. Think of the Cyclops, right? So these hybridized creatures, that's what they did. When they died, again, the body stays on the earth. But what happens to the spirit? They're not welcome in heaven and they can't, they can't go to the realm of the dead. They're not welcome there. So where are demons? in waterless, waterless places between the heavens and the realm of the dead. Guess where that is in between? In the biblical cosmology, that's the earth. So demons are all over us, all over us, everywhere. That's what demons truly are. Satan is not a demon. He's an angel. Or what you understand as an angel. So this, this should be making a lot more sense. So when you start to read scripture, you need to start having this shift of mentality. And the reason why the, the birth narrative of Jesus is a slap in the face to the, the fallen angels is because what they created was Cyclops. You've seen Cyclops. Cyclops look, look, look so bad, right? That don't look like nothing that God would create. Let's look at Cyclops. Look at this. Right. This is how many, uh, many, many traditions have Cyclops, not like not like Marvel, but that's what a Cyclops looks like. And what's fascinating in the name Watchers, it indicates that they're able to watch. 
So the Cyclops often had just one eye. So it's, it's, it's almost like it's interesting. Cyclops, right? Isn't that fascinating? So let's look at Nephilim. If you're really interested in this story, I think that the, the story of Noah, that movie Noah, um, was it Russell Crowe in that movie? I don't remember. If you want to know what's the Jewish tradition of the of the giants, just watch that movie. It's 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 pretty accurate according to Jewish tradition, which you you should already know. Hollywood is run by Jews, by the way. So these are the Nephilim. So when they died, they became demons. Now, why is that a slap in the face? Because these you can almost think about it as like the worst of each became one. But what is the thing about Jesus being man? He's not just man. He's fully God, fully divine and fully human. You can't take away from his humanity and you can't take away from his divinity. These things are we there's no way to fathom these things. There's absolutely no way to fathom the, the will of God or the works of the Lord. But you def, this is why I love the Bible. The Bible's not boring. You just we're not. You never going to hear this in church. Let's just say that. That's why it's boring because we've removed all the mystical elements, all the supernatural elements of the Bible. And we just are like, OK, imagine removing all the good parts of the Bible. Like that's why the Bible's boring to you because it's it's not an epic. And I'm not talking about epic like, hey, that was epic. The reason why we say things are epic is is because that comes from a, a Greek genre of writing, which was about a tale of a hero that had epic stories, divine experiences, semi-divine, supernatural experiences, right? Think of the, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, those are epics. It's, it's poetry. Just like comedy, comedy was a medieval genre that was about, like, storytelling it wasn't about he he ha ha it eventually became that but if you think about the divine comedy of dante uh paradiso uh the three-part series of 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 uh what's his name uh you know this is um i can't remember his name right now um this this is where these things come from like there were elements to these stories that we no longer have preserved and because we haven't preserved these things, we don't understand. What is the point of talking in tongues? You know what I'm saying? What is the point of talking in tongues? What is the point of Pentecost? Now when Pentecost happens, uh, uh, Shavuot on Monday till Tuesday, you'll understand what, what was God's plan. He was reversing the Tower of Babel. That's what it is. So it's, the Bible is fascinating, man. I love the Bible. I'm going to tell you that much. I'm absolutely in love with the Bible. There is nothing like the Bible, bro. I don't even need to read any more books. I got the book that I need. Like, this is so fascinating. And um, I, I love teaching, bro. Like, I love teaching these things. And I can't wait to teach, like, my wife the Bible. Like, I can't wait to know what she knows. Not that I have any, like... I just want to know what she knows, you know what I mean? And I want to teach her the word and and be taught by her. And then I want to teach my children the word. Like, you know how we've lost the art of like bedtime stories. I can't wait to tell the stories and like be epic with the story. Because, again, the, the boring thing that we do with the Bible is that we don't understand that the Bible wants us to add flavor to the Bible. It's presenting a bland vanilla experience so that it can transcend time and culture. And you are to imbue your essence, your culture, and your time into it while at the same time simultaneously understanding that this time doesn't pertain to you. And the Jews always understood this. This is what I tried to say yesterday. The Jews always understood this because the Bible wasn't written down until the Babylonian exile. The Bible was oral for the majority of the Jewish history. The church didn't even have the Bible until the 15th, 16th century. So for 1400, 1500 years, the Bible, the Bible wasn't even in the church. Think about that. You know what I'm saying? So what is the purpose of that? You got to ask like, well, why Lord? 
Why has the church endured more time without the Bible than with the Bible? What does that tell you? I won't answer that for you, but I want you to think critically about that. And I'm not trying to take importance away from the Bible, by the way, because I, I, I will die for that thing, bro. Like, I love the Bible, bro. I, I'm telling you. So when you're reading these, these, these stories, don't get bored. You need to make it interesting. You got to, you know, you got to add your little spin on it. Put your little, put your little sasson on it. Not too much, right? Now, we're we not trying to be sinful and all of that, but um, you got to read into it. You got to read into it. Read into the Bible, man. This is the beloved, bro. Like, I'm in love with the Lord, bro. Like I said this this morning in today's video, this is the love of my life. This right here is the love of my life. So I'm whether however I, f I feel, I'm making time to be in this word. Rain, sleet, snow, whatever, sunshine, I'm in this word. Whatever it is, high low it don't matter whatever season the same way i would be committed to my wife is the same way i'm committed to this word it's not about my interest oh i don't feel like doing it today no i gotta get into this word oh i don't feel like saying good morning no good morning when was the last time you woke up and said good morning to the lord when was the last time you asked god have you ate oh god have you had something to drink oh father and this is a i'm gonna hold this for for a video but I think that we depersonalize God too much and we really don't care about God and it shows in our behavior. We don't care because we don't think about God. And it's it's obvious, it's so apparent. And you're you're like, oh, well, God is not hungry. God doesn't thirst. What did Jesus do when he resurrected? Didn't he ask for fish? Didn't he eat and drink with the disciples? So when was the last time you asked God if he was hungry? When was the last time you asked God, are you thirsty, O oh Lord? Are you alone, O oh God? Wait, God is not alone? What you mean God is not alone? Oh, really? We're talking very humanly. We're talking very humanly. But I'm telling you, it almost makes me cry every single time that I think about it. The book of Isaiah says that God held his arms wide open, desiring to be sought, and nobody sought him. That's from the words of God's lips himself. When was the last time you asked God if he needed companionship? Or are we just asking God for the blessings and the promises we desire? What do we care about for real? Are we doing this for ourselves or is this for God? But anyways, guys. We're almost at an hour and a half. I'm going to close it and pray. I'll leave you to think about that. <sighs> Hopefully this helped you and it'll change your perspective on how truly fascinating your beloved is. There's depths. There's layers to this. There's levels to his, to his character, to his. <sighs> I'm in love, man, and I'm trying to help you fall in love. Because God is absolutely fascinating, man. He deserves your attention. He deserves your full commitment. He deserves your sacrifice. That you would say no, even though you have the right to say yes. To give up the things that you desire for his own pleasure. Father God, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh Lord. We ask that you forgive us for our incredulousness, O oh Father. For our contempt against you, O oh Lord. For all that we think about is ourselves, O oh Father. All we care about is me and I. For we have attempted to create Babel all over again. To create towers that ascend into heaven for our own name and our own glory, O oh God. And we pray that you would have mercy and patience upon us. We thank you that you do not rain fire and sulfur from heaven to destroy us, O oh God, but you are patient, desiring love over offense, O oh God. So much so you took upon all offense to demonstrate love. Thank you for enduring that cross for us, O oh God. Thank you for caring enough about us, O oh Lord, that you hear us even when we don't hear you. We thank you, O oh Father. We pray that your Holy Spirit would remind us of your desires 
Help us know you, Lord, personally and intimately so, O oh God. May we desire you above everything and all things, even more than ourselves. May your desires take precedence over our own, your plans, your purpose, your decisions, O oh Father. Your dreams, O oh Father, may they fulfill in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless your people in this day. Encourage them, O oh Father. Lift them up and exhort them. Embrace them and let them know how deeply you love them. But remind them of their love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So God bless you guys. Thank you for joining. Tomorrow we'll be preaching in Spanish. So hopefully you guys are ready for that. And then we'll get into Romans 16. It's not much to get into there. It's one of those mundane details that we always skip. But I'm going to show you how this is actually interesting stuff to get into. So hopefully you guys are excited. And I hope to have sparked some type of interest and desire in you to go deeper with the Lord. So anyways, guys, see you guys mañanas. Deuces. Peace.